Welcome to All Home Care Matters, the show where we discuss all things home care with discussions on important age-related matters and topics. Brought to you by Enriched Life Home Care Services, the number one rated home care provider in Michigan by top rated local. Hello, and welcome back to All Home Care Matters. If this is your first time visiting us here at the show, we want to say thank you for taking time out to be with us today. We appreciate how valuable everyone's time is, and that's why we try and make each episode here at All Home Care Matters something that will hopefully matter to you. Today, we are excited to welcome a remarkable guest, Christy Byrne Yates, author and caregiver coach. Welcome, Christy. How are you today? I'm good. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. We're glad to have you. So Christy, kind of walk us through how you became a caregiver coach and what that exactly entails. Sure. So uh, my story is like a lot of people's. I was raising my kids and I then was caring for my parents in the end of their life. And uh, that squeeze, which is often called the sandwich generation, was really impactful for me and my family uh, in, in difficult ways and in many wonderful ways. But when I came back to work, because I did take a little time off, people were approaching me left and right, like, oh, Christy, what did you do about this? How did you handle that? And I realized a lot of people don't know how to handle a lot of these things. And I certainly didn't have all the answers, but I took some time to research that. And I found that people really respond to, oh, think about this, think about these kinds of things. And in my work as a school psychologist, I was a school psychologist, school psychologist at that time, I did a lot of coaching with parents, with teachers, and coaching is not therapy. Coaching is not telling people what to do. It's helping people find what's right for them. So that model really uh, appealed to me in working with people who might be going through the same challenges, caregiving, and then also sandwich generation challenges. So you're also an author as well. Did you write the book before you got into caregiving and coaching or how did that come about? Well, yeah, it all sort of, um, to be honest, Lance, that book was just my way of processing all that happened with me. There's a lot of memoir in there about my experiences, but I also, because I'm sort of a, a data geek and a research geek and a, <laughs> a psychologist geek, I, I had to dive into some of the research and look at was that what was what I went through happening for other people. And so I just decided to put it all together and write the book that I, I could have used. And so I put it out there as more of a service thing. And from that time, I realized, you know, a lot of people could use this. And so in 2021, I released the book and then, and it took me, you know, five years to write it. But I also then retired as a school psychologist and started doing this more full time. So it's just my way of um, meeting a need that's out there that kind of brings a lot of different pieces of my life together. So it's been a labor of love. What has been one of the biggest surprises you found when helping families and helping to coach these caregivers that you may not have expected? Um just how much people uh, might not have thought about what is coming, that this is all, that it, that it feels like such a surprise for folks. Um, and that is really my experience in many ways. Um, you know, we get, we get so wound up in our lives, raising our kids, and I'm speaking here mostly about those sandwich generation parents, but we get wrapped up in our kids' lives and what's going on there. And then if we are blessed enough to be able to see our parents a lot and have a good relationship with them, we might um, we might notice a lot of changes, but sometimes those changes, wow, they're like sudden, they feel sudden. And right. they're not really sudden, but they feel sudden. And so people are really like, I didn't know I needed to think about these things. And so that's always, it's interesting to me how common that is and how painful that can be for folks. And then also, when we wait till the you know times when we have to jump in because it's a crisis we're, we might not be making the best choices we don't have as many choices available to us so that's another message in my book is to start talking now when your parents are in great health this is the time really to have those great conversations about you know 
how do we want this to be the best it can be? Because we all know we're all going to lose our parents. We're all going to pass away. And, and it doesn't have to be a morbid conversation. It can be one full of life and one full of joy. Like, how do we make this the best it can be? And how do we make that a legacy of love we pass on to our kids too? What advice do you give to people who are in similar situations as you were when you do try to have those conversations, but maybe the parents aren't receptive to it? Yeah, that I mean, and that is a big thing. Parents and sometimes siblings. And there's sort of a, um, we, we really haven't normalized talking about end of life or death in, in our culture. Um, and so I, I say, tread lightly. Um, but also really prepare yourself for those conversations, right? Enter those conversations as somebody who's seeking to understand rather than somebody who's coming in to say, mom, dad, you have to do these things. You know, really it's seeking to understand. And so one of the ways you can prepare yourself is to really ask yourself the questions that you intend to ask other people and answer them for yourself. Because if you're a parent and you have kids, you're going to need to think about these end of life issues right. sometime. So give yourself that time to really prepare and really focus on the intention of seeking to understand rather than tell somebody what they need to do. Well, in being in, you know, the way society is now and these generations, we don't all necessarily live in the same community as well. <laughs> and so you can have families on, you know, the West coast, trying to help a parent on the East Coast or in the Midwest or vice versa. Yeah. How, do you, how do you face those challenges and dilemmas? Yeah, those are really tricky. And um, we are an incredibly mobile society. And um, in my research, I found Americans tend to move 11 times from the time they were born, from where the, the place they, they were born. And we're not being born and buried in the same place anymore. It's, we are all over the place. And um that's really tricky i think with you know the technology that we have now it's become easier um i think there are ways that you can try to get to know that because we have this technology we can get to know the communities that our parents live in and find things for them if we need to um, and then it's really a matter of trying to orchestrate um, and and collaborate with people who might be nearby with your parents to help out and and then how do you stay in touch in a way with your parents that's um, helpful for them and not a burden right and so sometimes you might have a situation where you have to rely on caregiving communities that can uh, services like your own or um, other kinds of um, communities that can help your parents and then being able to stay as on top of that as you can. I think it's a really hard thing, Lance, and I appreciate all the professionals out there who are helping those parents and those um, adult children. They're, they're um, so valuable. And what about for the caregivers who maybe they're not necessarily right now looking for tips or resources for helping their parents, but for helping themselves? What are some things that they can do to practice good self-care? Oh, yeah, huge. And we hear a lot about self-care these days. I feel like self-care is, in my book, I call it ruthless self-care because with our children, right, we're ruthless. If something happens with our kids, we drop things and we go for it and we take care of them. Um, but we don't always do that with ourselves. So really, I think um, switching our mindset about what self-care is because self-care isn't really just bubble baths and massages right. it's really having that attitude of i know that i'm worthy and deserving of self-care i know that i need to put myself first in order to be the best i can be and and so thinking of ourselves like you know like we take care of our car, right? We make sure we have gas in the tank. We take care of, we, we, we change the oil when we need to. When those red lights come on, we, we pay attention to them. And we don't pay attention to the red lights that come up in our own bodies. And so I think it's also connecting back to really listening to your body, listening to what's going on for you uh, physically, emotionally. I know, I, I always joke, when I feel like my, sh uh, my earlobes are touching my shoulder blades, I know I need to stop because that's <laughs> stress for me because that's where I hold it. So I have to like, ooh, 
this is my time. And it's simple little things, Lance. It's things like learning how to really stop and take a deep breath, like a really good breath. And we don't, we don't stop to do that enough. And um, so it's little things that we can do. And it's also daily habits that we can put into place. And so, and I also believe that when you practice good self-care, even if it's taking some time away from your children, your children are watching you and they're learning from you all the time. And what they're learning there is it's important to take care of yourself. So involving your kids in a wellness practice practice is really important too. Teach them young how to do self-care. How great is that? Because we're all going to need some help now and then. We're all going to need some self-care now and then. Aside from the self-care Christy, what would you say are two or three of the most important things that families who may just be entering into this foray of, you know, caregiving for a loved one or who may in the future, what advice would you offer them? I think um, one of the reasons I called my book Building a Legacy of Love is that my parents had, um, they had put a lot of things in writing. They had done a lot of the hard work themselves they knew what they wanted at the end of their lives they had had experiences with their own parents and that helped them formulate what they wanted to do so they took the steps they needed to do like um, building a financial plan help being um, good stewards of their money so that their children didn't have to take care of them Um, and they started doing this very early and they also formed a trust and had every all the legal papers drawn up so that when it came time for myself and my brother and my sister to really think about this, we had a blueprint and it was all there. And that was such a gift because then I was free to just be there with them and help them through the different stages. But I didn't have to ask them a lot of questions. And it was a wake up call for my husband and I. And so then in our 40s we said oh what are we doing and we started to put those building blocks into place and so that's what i would say to folks is it's never too early to have the conversations it's never too early to start thinking about how what you're going to pass along to your kids not just material but also ways of being um, mindset how you think about money how you think about life and death um, compassion all of those things are building blocks to to then passing on a legacy of love and so that's what i would say to folks is it's never too early to think about this for yourself too right what uh what's some of the feedback that's really stood out to you from readers of your book do you have any that really resonated yeah yeah you know i've been delighted um most of the um reviews i've gotten on amazon and in person have been i felt like i was talking to a friend so that made me feel good. But people saying, wow, you know, I didn't know I needed this. That's been a common thing. Um, but mostly just that feeling of, you know, I can relate to this. This is something I see myself in now, or I just feel seen because other people don't know what this is like if they're not going through it. And all these steps are things that I need to think about. So it was, it's accessible. That's what I've heard. It's just like, wow, I can, it's easier to read. It's re it's readable. You know, it's readable. It relates to me. I feel like I'm talking to a friend who knows what I'm going through. And that's, that, that is heartwarming to me because that's really what I wanted to give people was that comfort that I needed. And even some clarity. I don't, I can't tell people what to do because everybody, every family is different, but there are some common things we can think about. Well, and I know you're also a member of All's Authors as well, correct? Yes, yeah. How long have you yeah. been uh, with them? Um, well, they reached out to me shortly after I published my book, and I was I was unaware of them. I'm so glad I know about them now, and I talk about them all the time because, and I actually do some work with them volunteer wise. It's an all volunteer led organization of. Uh, there's, I don't know, six founding members, four, four to six founding members who really put together a collection of books and materials for people who are um, experiencing the journey of dementia in some form. Um, and it's just been wonderful. So they have, they represent, not represent in terms of an editorial sense, right. but they have curated about 400 authors 
It's great. It's a wonderful resource for people. I think anybody in the uh, profession of caregiving or caregiving agencies, this is a great resource to give to families because there are wonderful books for people um, written by authors who've been through this journey. But there are also books by people who have early onset dementia. I mean, what a great resource to hear from somebody about what this is like. And then also as a um, sort of a child advocate, there's wonderful books for kids, how to explain dementia to your children, how to help them learn how to interact with grandma or grandpa and, and understand what's going on. And books are a great way to start those conversations. So Absolutely. I just think it's a wonderful, wonderful resource. Yeah, they're, they do great work and we're very good friends with several of the people there. And, you know, we love supporting the work that they're doing because of, yeah. you know, stories like yours and your book and others. You know, there's a lot of bad information on the Internet. There's books mm -hmm. that don't necessarily get facts correct and they give mm -hmm. people false hope or a false misrepresentation of what it's like caring for a loved one with dementia or what right. the dementia journey is even like. And, you know, they're kind of, I call them the gatekeepers to the information. You know, they, they protect it so that they, you know, keep the integrity of the experience and everybody's journey is different, of course, but yes, they don't give a false picture of what to expect or what you're going to go through. And plus they're sharing like stories like yours and theirs of, you know, real world experiences. And I just, it's very commendable, the work that they yeah. do, and we love offering our support whenever we can. Agreed. I think they're great. Yeah. Thanks for supporting them. They're oh, wonderful. Absolutely. So your book, Building a Legacy of Love, Thriving in the Sandwich Generation, we're going to have the link here up on the screen as well as in our show notes and a link to your website as well. And mm -hmm. do, you, do you recommend this book only to people who might be in the sandwich generation, or is this a book that anybody could relate to? I think it's a book that most people can relate to on some level. I think if you have children, it's a great book to pick up and look at because even if your parents might not um, still be living, there are other aspects in this book that can help you thinking about um, how to trans or how to build that legacy of love, right? How do you transfer these values that you have for, to your family so that you can even change history, right? Like if you've had a terrible um, childhood or something, there are ways you can you can stop that pattern. And so there's some thoughts in there about that. Um, I think if you're someone who's older, maybe you're the grandparent. This is a great wake up call too. Like, oh, what can I do now? Maybe here's why I need to talk about it. I mean, I'll tell you, Lance, I've talked to some older folks, even family members, and it's... Um, sometimes it's like oh you know you guys just do what you want to do and that and they think that that's lessening the burden right. when in fact that's adding a burden right um like oh i don't care what kind of service you have for me you know what tell your children what kind of service you might like it's okay to ask for those things it's okay to say don't do these things please do these things because at the moment when your adult child has to pull some things together they don't need the extra burden of having to sort of think about, oh, what would they want? What would they want? If they just right. have that from you, then they can be there and be present for you when you need them and present for their kids. So I, I think it's, it's, um, it can serve a lot of purposes. Wonderful. And if people want to reach out to you for uh, caregiving coaching, where would they go? My website's great. There's a contact form in there. Um, I also, um, have a YouTube website, so, and, and I love your YouTube channel too. You, you, and I want to just put a plug out there for folks. YouTube channels are great. And one of the reasons they're wonderful, and I'm so grateful you have such rich content is because when you're in that sandwich, right? Especially if you work, you're working, you can't get to find all the things you need till like 11 o'clock at night. So it's great. Right. Well, thank you. Um, and so, yeah, you can find most, um, you can contact me, you can find out what I'm up to all on my website. And we'll have, and then I'm, and then I'm on social media too. So you can find me there. Sorry. And sorry. we'll have, no, you, no, you're fine. And we'll have all of the social media links up as well. Um, you're on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and uh, you mentioned your YouTube channel. And, you know, when you are in the situation, whether you're in the sandwich or you're not in the sandwich and you find yourself all of a sudden caring for a loved one, it's challenging 
and it's overwhelming mm-hmm. yeah. and you're not, I call it a controlled environment because now you're in the middle of the, you know, the pressure mm-hmm. and you can lead to bad decisions and making uninformed yes. decisions. So it's important to have people there who have the best interests of your loved ones and you in mm-hmm. mind and help guide you and, you know, coach you through some situations that let's be honest, nobody grows up planning or preparing to be a caregiver for somebody. No. Yeah. I mean, that is actually another common thing I hear from people like, I didn't ask for this. Who does? Right. It's right. just, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and you raise a good point and and that is when you're in crisis that is not the best time to make you don't make great decisions when you're in crisis you know there's just a whole neurological reason why you don't right your brain is not fully functioning you are you're uh you're operating with less um less of your faculties to really pull it all together and there's a whole whole bit about that but um yeah it's really important to think of these things when you're in a calmer place and you don't have to be worried. Well, Christy Byrne Yates, thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing your story and all of your resources and books with our viewers and listeners. And we look forward to having you back on again in the future. Thanks, Lance. This has been delightful and I'm really grateful. Thank you so much. And thanks for the work you do too. I really appreciate it. It's, it's our pleasure, Christy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Hey there. A lot of times as a caregiver or as a parent or mm, as a human being, we have a lot of expectations. We have expectations of ourselves. We have expectations of other people. We have high expectations. Sometimes we have low expectations. But the whole thing about expectations is we can't control a lot of the conditions that are necessary for those expectations to be met, right? We can't change the what's happening in the world. We can't change the weather. We can't change what someone else thinks or feels or, or their behavior. We can control our own behavior. We can even control what we think about, and we can control how we intend to show up to certain activities or to our relationships with other people, right? So if we want to have a really loving relationship with our parents, our partners, our spouses, our friends, our neighbors, our children, we have to generate those feelings of, you know, I want to get along. I want to show up as my best self. I, I want to listen. I want to be calm. Whatever we know will make that a, a good interaction. So how do we do that? So sometimes we have to let go of some of those expectations. So I'm going to offer a tapping round on how you might shift from expecting a lot of things and start thinking about what's my internal process so that I can um, show up with the intentions of being my best self. All right. So we'll go ahead and start on the side of our hand here. Oh, even though sometimes I have really high expectations of myself and others, I deeply and completely love and accept myself. Even though I have high expectations of myself and others, I deeply and completely love and accept myself. And even though I have high expectations of myself and others, I deeply and completely love and accept myself and anyone else who may have an impact on this for me. all these expectations. I have such high expectations for myself. I want to be the best. I want to be the brightest. I want to be the fastest. I want to be the richest. I want to be the happiest. I want to be the funniest. all these expectations. And I sometimes get let down because I can never be all those things. I can't control what's going on around me. I can't control who I'm gonna see and interact with. 
I can't control how other people are going to think about me. I can't control how other people are going to feel about me. So I'm letting go of expectations of myself. I'm letting go of expectations of others. I can't control other people's thoughts. I can't, I can't control their beliefs. I can't control how they intend to show up. I can't control other people. So I'm letting go of expectations of others. And I'm gonna focus on my intentions. I'm gonna focus on intentions for my behavior. I'm gonna focus on my intentions for my feelings. I'm gonna focus on my intentions for how I'm going to prepare for interactions. I'm gonna focus on what I can do. Who do I wanna be today? How do I wanna feel today? What do I need to do to feel my best? What do I need to do to be present to other people? What do I need to do to feel that I'm operating at my optimal level. Maybe, the, maybe these are things I have to do. I might need to sleep more. I might need to eat well. I might need to limit my intake of the news for the day. I might listen to music that makes me feel happy. I might give hugs to people I love. I might get good exercise. And I might focus on what I can do to be my best. So I'm letting go of expectations and I'm focusing on my intentions. My intention is to be a loving person. My intention is to be effective. My intention is to be present. My intention is to be patient. My intention is to be someone who contributes. And I'm gonna let go of all that isn't helping me towards that end. In body, mind, and spirit. So take a deep breath. Let some of that go. Let go of those expectations. Focus on what you can do Focus on how you want to show up, not so that someone else feels a certain way about you, but how you feel about you. How do you feel about how you're showing up? How do you feel about how you're walking into the relationships that you have? And that's what's most important because you can't control how other people feel, but you can control how you feel about yourself and how you show up for other people. So hope that's helpful. And Uh, have a great day. All right. Bye. Thank you for joining us today here at All Home Care Matters. All Home Care Matters is here to help families as they navigate these long-term care issues. We invite you to visit us at allhomecarematters.com where there's a private, secure, fillable form where you can give us feedback, show ideas, or if you have questions, every form is read and responded to. And remember, you can listen to the show on any of your favorite podcast streaming platforms or watch the show on our official YouTube channel. 
just make sure to hit that subscribe button so that you never miss an episode. We'd also like to say thank you again to Christy Byrne Yates for joining us today to talk about her book and coaching caregivers through the sandwich generation. Thank you so much, and we look forward to seeing you next time here at All Home Care Matters. Thank you for joining us today. We look forward to you joining us again on another episode of All Home Care Matters. To learn more about the show and to connect with us, visit us at allhomecarematters.com.